talk. Um, then we'll go to the last speaker of this more of this first morning session. Uh, Tanya, if you can start sharing your screen. Yes. Uh, I think you can see my screen. Yes, I saw, I saw. Yeah, and, and there is some box to the right. I don't know what it is, but and oh, those are your Zoom things. Yeah, also on the top. It looks good right now, I think. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Then we'll go to our next speaker. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your family name correctly. Tanya Kushwaha, but you can pronounce this as, as it should in a second. Um, who it's will correct. Talk to, oh, it's correct. Okay, phew. Who will talk about unveiling nascent stars with sulfur-bearing molecules. Um, please go ahead. Uh, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for this opportunity to present the talk in Maya. And as the title suggests, I have used uh, nascent stars in this study and I have studied these stars using sulfur bearing molecules. So the goal of this project was to derive H2S OCS ratio in the envelopes of low mass protostars, which could provide us crucial information about the physical and chemical conditions around these, around these low mass stars. So physical conditions such as temperature and radiation. And this ratio would al also help us to understand the sulfur chemistry in low mass stars, which remains a puzzle uh, still. Uh, and sulfur bearing species have been detected in many different regions in the universe, such as in ISM and hot molecular cores and starburst galaxies. And we have observed that the sulfur that the total sulfur abundance in diffuse clouds is equal to the cosmic abundance of sulfur whereas in the case of dense clouds we have observed a, a depletion of 1000 uh, percent of the total sulfur abundance and this problem of missing sulfur in dense clouds is often known as uh, the missing sulfur problem in astrochemistry uh, which we still do not know where this missing sulfur is and in what form. We can use sulfur bearing species to study the physical and chemical conditions around the protostars and, and they have been proposed in the literature as the chemical clocks of the protostars. And here I'm, I'm presenting you a few ex possible explanations from the past studies in the literature and what we and what we know from uh, what we believe from from one of the studies is that sulfur is mainly present on the dust grain as H2S. So here on the right, you see an image uh, of a carton of a dust grain. So a dust grain is basically a, a, a carton of uh, an, uh, an ice. And here, this is the dust grain. And in cold environment, in dense environment, when the temperature is very low, chemical species, they stick to the dust grain and they freeze out there. So they form ices and this ice formation is, is actually uh, affected by many physical processes, many physical and chemical processes. Other possible explanation for this missing sulfur is that because we have observed uh, longer sulfur chains uh, in ERAS 16293, that's why we can, we can say that to form those longer sulfur chains, we need a longer sulfur chain so that from the decomposition of that, we can form the, the smaller chains. And so from that, uh, we, it has been said that it can be present as octasulfur or from chemical modeling and laboratory, other laboratory experiments, we, we believe that it can be also as mineral sulfides or organosulfur. But what we, what we believe from the laboratory experiments is that uh, sulfur is present mainly as H2S ices. And here is the problem that we have not yet detected H2S ices. H2S ices, uh, we have only detected OCS ices. And we know the abundance of OCS ices. So in my study, I had two data sets, both for ALMA-ACA band 6 observations uh, from the project uh, PIs. And here is the spectral, uh, uh, here is the frequency range of the data and the spectral resolution. So one data had a higher spectral resolution. And here is the spatial resolution and the noise level. 
And here I'm presenting you the spectra, full spectra of uh, one of the sources. Uh, it's ERAS 16293P. And so in total, I had 10 sources, four sources from the first data set for which I had a higher spectral resolution and, and uh, six sources from the second data set for which I have uh, lower spectral resolution. And all these sources have binary and single binary or single component uh, in them. And they are present in clustered environment. Nine of them are present in clustered environment, meaning that they are present in cloud complexes and they are affected by the complexities of their cloud. Whereas this star, PHR71 from the second data set, this is the only isolated source in our sample. And this is a very interesting source, which I'll uh, show you uh, in the results section. So I firstly extracted the spectra for all my sources from the data cubes and, uh, and then I detected sulfur bearing molecules uh, from the observed spectra and I fitted, I fitted synthetic, uh, synthetic spectra for the detected species using LTE model. And here are the input parameters of uh, model, uh, column density, excitation, temperature, line width, et cetera. I also look for blending species because blending in the detected lines can cause an underestimation of column densities, which we do not want uh, because it is not the true column density, which we would expect. Uh, we also derived column densities of isotopologues because in addition to main sulfur bearing species, we have also detected their isotopologues. Uh, we have also calculated the line, calculated the optical depths of the lines because again, line opacity can play in and uh, and we it, and it can result in an underestimation of column densities. And following all these steps, we derived chemical, we derived H2S OCS ratio for the sources. And here I'm presenting you line reductions uh, only for ERAS 16293B. For this source, we have detected H2S and OCS lines of these transitions. We have also detected many isotopologues. Here I'm presenting you two uh, H233S and H234S, uh, you can see the lines are shown by yellow color and this line specifically here is blended by CH3, uh, CH3CHO molecule. Uh, here is the other, uh, other isotopologue of H2S. We have also studied the dependence of, uh, the dependence of H2S OCS ratio on the source sizes. Uh, um, assuming one, so one arc second source size and two arc second source size. And what we found out, find, found out is that H2S OCS ratio does not depend on the assumed source size. Although the column density is changed, the ratio does not. So we derived the ratio for all our sources except one source, EMB25, because for this source, we, only, we could only derive uh, upper limits on H2S and OCS. Uh, so once we had the ratio, we compared the H2S OCS ratio with the H2S OCS ratio of the comet, of comet and ISM ISIS. For cometary ratio, we chose 67 PCG because for this comet, we have H2S and OCS abundances from Rosetta mission, and we also have their uncertainty. So here in the plot, in the with the black dashed line, you see the cometary H2S OCS ratio. And in the gray shaded region, you see the uncertainty on the ratio. For ISM ISIS, we chose W33A, which is a high mass star. And the cold outer protostellar envelope of this high mass star is, is assumed to, to represent uh, ISIS. And as I said previously, we have not uh, detected ISIS because it is difficult to detect it in infrared spectra. So we only have an upper limit on H2S and we have OCS detected in it, uh, which is shown by a uh, uh, red dash dotted line here. Uh, and I have plotted uh, the ratios of all my sources. And from this plot, you can see that the ISM ISIS ratio uh, lie within the uncertainty of uh, cometary ratios. And we have found the lowest ratio in ERAS 16293A and the highest in BHR71, uh, which is a, an isolated source. And this is a clustered source. And uh, the ratio depends uh, on the environment of the cloud and on the age of the cloud. So we uh, specifically studied this source, uh, this uh, interesting source, BHR71, because its ratio is within the 
uncertainty within the uncertainty of uh, cometry ratio and uh, very close to the ISMISIS ratio. And what we can conclude from this is that maybe the cloud of PHR71 has not evolved much. Maybe the chemical abundances of this cloud is still, uh, is still closer to the ISMISIS or it is still closer to ISMISIS and uh, maybe it has not gone through all the chemical reactions which other classic sources might have. Uh, also, because it is an isolated source, uh, it might have received a lower photo irradiation. And what photo irradiation does is that if you have uh, H2S ice uh, on a dust grain, then because of photo radiation, this H2S ice can be converted to OCS ice when H2S reacts with CO. And then in, in, up in the protostar, uh, in class zero or class one phase, when the core heats up, this ice sublimates to the gas phase. So depending on what the chemical species was present on the ice, uh, we will get uh, the chemical content in the gas phase, which we have uh, from ALMA. So this lower photo, so it might have received lower photo ir irradiation. And because of this, uh, there might have been lower H2S to OCS conversion. Uh, and hence we see a higher H2S OCS ratio in the gas phase. So here is the uh, solid phase ratio, and here is the gas phase ratio of the protostars, which you have observed uh, using ALMA. Uh, also, uh, one interesting thing about this source is that uh, in one of the recent studies, it is found that water jitteration in isolated sources such as VHR-71 is two to four times higher than in clustered sources such as ERAS-16293 or ERAS-4, which is also our sources. and. Uh, in this paper, they have uh, two other isolated sources, which we do not have. So definitely we need more observations towards uh, other isolated sources. And uh, I would just like to point one fact that dust grains can actually be heated, not just by, uh, in, not just by radiation from other protostars, uh, but also from cosmic rays. So, so from this, uh, well, from this study, uh, I have the ratio, H2S OCS ratio of, for the sources. Uh, I have found the lowest ratio in ERAS 16293A and highest in BHR 71. And as I said, lower ratio could be due to lower conversion from H2S to OCS ISIS. And high could be, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so low ratio could be due to higher conversion and uh, high ratio could be due to lower uh, conversion from H2 ISIS to OCS ISIS. So the future work is uh, currently in writing a paper on it. Uh, we still have to refine our results. And uh, for future work, we definitely need uh, more observations uh, towards other sources and specifically towards these isolated sources, which were also present in the Gensel et al. paper. And we would like to uh, link somehow the water deterioration and uh, sulfur, sulfur uh, chemistry, if they can be linked. And also we want uh, high spatial resolution data from GWST. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tanya, for this wonderful talk. Um, I have a question, but let's see first if there's already questions in the chat. Elisabeth? Yes, we have one. Nice talk. Have you tried to run some chemical modeling? Uh, no, actually, this I did as my, uh, as my summer research project, so I didn't have much uh, time to do it. But since we have found really nice results, uh, uh, I think we can do more in this uh, subject, but yeah, I haven't tried any modeling, any chemical modeling. Thank you. We have another one. Can you illustrate more how cosmic ray will affect uh, the two tracer, suppress or enhance the ratio? Uh, yes, so that's what I wanted to point that this is actually a very complex problem and this so the radiation does not only depend on the cloud complexities, but also from other factors such as cosmic rays. So the point uh, is that we need, we definitely need more sources to analyze, to do some statistics uh, on sulfur chemistry for protostars. That's what I wanted to point. Uh, we have another question. I'm not too familiar with the OCS. 
But in my experience, H2S can be optically thick. Sorry if I miss you mentioning it, but did you take this into account? Uh, yes, so because H2S and OCS both were optically thick, uh, that's why uh, instead of taking the column densities of them directly, we have their isotopologs and we computed the column density of the main species, so H2S and OCS, from the column densities of isotopologs because they were optically thin to avoid this effect. Thank you. We have another one. In the source with low H2S, does the sulfur remain primarily as atomic ionized form or does it form other molecules? Uh, it does form other molecules such as SO, SO2, uh, but what we believe from the laboratory experiments is that uh, it is in the main form, H2S is the main form, what we know from the laboratory experiments. But since we have not yet detected uh, H2S ices, uh, it still remains a question. But yeah, there is GWST now, so hopefully uh, we will be able to detect it in infrared spectra. Thank you. I, I have a question. If you could go to your conclusion slides. Yes. So you say hey, that you know the low ratio could be due to excessive radiation from nearby stars, and the high ratio could be due to isolation, less radiation. So what observations would be necessary to, to test these hypotheses? Uh, so I think just because we have one isolated source, uh, we cannot put a strong conclusion about this. And we definitely need to have more isolated sources to exactly know if this is really the case. And also because uh, for this source, uh, we had lower resolution. Uh, we need mm -hmm. data for these sources. So I think it would be really nice to have uh, observations specifically for these two sources, yeah. uh, which was also presented in the other paper. And then I think uh, we can make a good conclusion from this uh, if it is really affected by uh, radiation or there are other external effects. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a curiosity if we have time. Yes, we have time. In slide eight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. When uh, uh, you okay. compare the observed and synthetic uh, spatter. Uh, yes. Uh, this one? I'm not in the field, sorry if I miss something. <laughs> when you compare the synthetic spectrum and the observed one, uh, I I'm seeing that the synthetic is not fitting very well the observed spectrum. Do you have some explanation on what it can be do? Uh, yes, the line widths, actually this is due to broadening effects that the line widths of uh, the observed spectra is, is wider and also because it is suffering from line blending in the wings uh, in the case of H234S. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I know we are missing a lot of flux, I think here in this part, we have to, we should look at this. Thank you, very good. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for your talk. I would like to thank um, all speakers of this morning session for their talk, um, for staying on time, but also everyone attending uh, for asking great questions.